The other thing I want to encourage you, some very, 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 very serious news. Um, Anthony Scalia died this weekend, which could be some of the worst news we've had in the United States in a long, long time. Scalia is a very fine Supreme Court justice, really stood to right things so many times, one of the best, if not the best, current justice. And so what that does now is give us a president who doesn't know beans from donuts and uh, to appoint somebody. And uh, I'm really concerned about what this means. <clears throat> and if uh, Obama appoints a Supreme Court justice, then the whole court will turn. It's been 5-4. Uh, five and kind of really committed to the Constitution. Four who don't know what the Constitution is. And uh, so this is real serious stuff. And whether you're Republican, Democrat, you know, we can talk about that another time. This isn't the place for it. But this is a very serious moment in the history of the U.S. And who that man is uh, appointed now uh, will be amazing. And so please be praying about that. This could be a very, very serious step in the wrong direction for us as a nation. Now, God can do whatever he wants. He could choose to appoint somebody very bad. And uh, he'll use that for his glory. But I want you to be praying a lot about that, and I want to pray about that this morning. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this man who has, at least for all I can tell, uh, really stood very strongly for the Constitution. He's been a modifying influence in much of the horrible stuff that's going on in the Supreme Court. And I don't know what his relationship with you is like, but I pray now that you'd look with mercy in our country and not allow another horrible justice to be appointed. Because if this is the case, then we're all going to suffer. And so I pray in your mercy, whatever you need to do, that you would eventually allow the person that will be best for us a nation to be there it could very well be that your judgment on this nation will continue by appointing somebody really awful. But I pray that you'd help us to know how to pray and to pray about matters like this. We do not put our faith in princes or politicians, but we ask, Lord, that this country that has been faithful to you in the past would return, that there would be a revival that would come before you return. So I pray that you'd look with mercy on us and that you would have your perfect way and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're coming to our study of Ephesians again these days. And I tell people every once in a while about how many messages we've had in Ephesians so far. This is message number 71 as we have been working our way through. So as you see, we're just roaring through at an almost unimaginable pace. Uh, no, we're taking our time because we want to really understand these things. And we've come now to what really I think is one of the highlight chapters of the book of Ephesians. And we'll be here for a long time because the next uh, section that we'll get to in weeks ahead is absolutely profound. But what we have in front of us is an amazing passion of Scripture. And we started looking at it a couple of weeks already, and we're going to spend a couple more before we move on. But Paul says, as a prisoner... For the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, this comes immediately after the prayer at the end of chapter 3, where we spent many, many weeks looking at what, in my view, is the neatest prayer in the New Testament, where Paul prays for the people of God. And that prayer culminates in the phrase, I pray that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And I pray that pray more now than I ever have because of the studies we did in that chapter. But what does a person filled to all the fullness of God look like? Well, this passage tells us, and it's striking because it's not what you would expect. It says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then he defines this person. And he says, be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, I must admit to you that probably the last couple of weeks of months have been the most difficult months I have spent since I've been at Rolling Hills Covenant. These have been very, 
very difficult days for me. And I said, I know it's because of what I'm teaching. Be completely humble and merciful. And the thing that scares me half to death, the next word is patient. <laughs> and you know how you learn patience, don't you? Through trial. And I'm thinking, all right, Lord, if you've chosen to make this this difficult, what is the next word going to be? So when I get a little closer to the word patience, I'll ask for extra prayer from all of you as we look at that. But I have really been enjoying looking at what it means to be called worthy of the Lord, to be completely humble and gentle. Now, we have been using, and I introduced it last week, and I bought this just for this series. This now sits on my desk. And the word, uh, to live a life worthy, is based on a scale. And the picture there is of a person's life in the midst of a scale. Are we living a life absolutely worthy of what God wants? And that involves two absolute results. The first one is we love God, his word, his will, his presence, his promise, his power, his absolute right to be the Lord of my life. Now, all of those phrases are important. Now, one of the things that concerns me a lot is it's very popular to talk about loving God and the love of God. But sadly, it's kind of this nebulous, uh, almost Valentine feeling. Give somebody a little card and a flower and they move on with the rest of life. No, this is the love of God that translates into really wanting and knowing his word, which we'll talk more about that in a minute, to want his will, to want his presence. And in the midst of knowing his presence, to live his promises, his power, and then this one, his absolute right to rule my life. Whatever he chooses, that's what it is to live a life worthy of the Lord. But then the second one, the second piece of it that we've been looking at is to treat people, life, trials, disappointments, victories, everything out of the fullness that comes from his presence and power in our lives. So that's kind of the summary of what this passage is all about. It's living a life worthy. And we've talked already about this picture of the scale where two equal weights are brought about in perfect balance. Now the scale right now, as I have it set, is, uh, is not equal balance. Now I have a little lever here, and if they were equal, that's really what this picture is, that what's on one side equals out the other side. Now what the scale is talking about here in our case is who God is as opposed to who we are. We'll see more of that in just a minute. It's God's truth on the one side and our practice of that on the other side perfectly balanced. So in other words, that what doctrine tells us is what we do. Now let me try to illustrate that for you. Most of us, when we drive, will drive in the range of 65 miles an hour on the freeway. Now if you're doing that around here on the surface streets, that's a bit of a problem. But can you understand that you just kind of think, all right, this morning I'm going to pray, Lord, you know, I've just kind of been seeking you, and I think it seems right to me to drive 65. I just feel like 65 is the right speed. Is that why we drive 65? No, and that's the reason why most of us don't drive 65 in a 65 mile an hour speed limit, because it's not about that. If the feeling was the case, that's what we'd be doing. The reason we drive 65 is because that's what the law says. And if you will, that's a perfect illustration of what this passage is about. That because God has stated what he wants us to do, that's what we do. Let me make it even more particular, and this is getting fairly close. Let's just say that April 15th gets close around, and you turn to somebody in your life, and you say, you know, I was just praying yesterday, and... I have this feeling that we should give the government some money. They've done so many nice things for us. They have those lovely parks, and they've made all these nice rules, and all these things. We just love the government so much, we're just kind of deciding that we're going to just send them thousands of dollars. Now, if you do that, you have a mental problem. <laughs> Why do we send the government money on or about April the 15th? 
because we have to, it's the law. Now, what's so interesting to me that we live most of our lives under the authority and understanding of what law says, but we don't think about when it comes to the Christian life. Our lives are to be perfectly balanced between what God says we should do and be and what we are. Now, the second meaning of this we looked at a little bit last week is the word becoming. And I talked a lot about the idea of appropriate dress. I urge you to live a life becoming of the calling that you have received. And last week I wore not too bad of a clashing tie with my coat, but I did it on purpose and I talked to you about it. Now today my tie kind of goes with my coat, so this is the opposite. Now many of you are very sensitive about right clothing. Some of you were invited and forgot to go. <laughs> but becoming means that we act in a manner appropriate to the set. And scripture says that's what God is calling us to do. Live a life worthy that matches the balance that is becoming. The idea here is appropriate, matching, coordinated. So the picture here is of clothing that matches, does not clash, that is appropriate to age and setting. All right, so Paul is saying, I want you to live a life worthy of the gospel that is fitting in the balance and is appropriate. So be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's God's standard. Now I wonder, when you think about living a life worthy of the Lord, is the very first thing that comes to your mind to be completely humble? And I think for most of us, that's not where our thinking goes. Because our culture does not applaud that. Matter of fact, the culture is quite opposed to that. It says, fight for your place, you have a right, so on. So he says, if we're going to live worthy, we are completely humble, gentle, or meek, which we'll see next week. Patient, bearing with one another in love. When you think about a worthy Christian life, what comes to mind? Well, in, in most people's mind, when you picture this scale, and you measure yourself with what God wants, what happens is the scale is uh, balanced by our actions. And usually, at least in the circles I've moved, those actions are revolving around the phrase, don't. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't go to movies, don't go to car, don't play cards, don't dance, don't have sex. It, it just varies on the group. I've told you that one church I was a part of as a teen, they said, don't wear watches, don't wear wedding rings, don't wear earrings. They, they were very opposed to anything with jewelry. And having grown up in different, 13 different denominations, I've seen each group has their own list of don'ts. Now, when the actions are positive on the other side, there are things that we are to do, like go to church, read your Bible, pray, and serve. But I want you to notice something here. That's not what God's talking about in Ephesians 4, 2. These are attitudes. They're life characteristics, core traits that define a life lived worthy of the calling. It's not the actions, it's the character out of which those actions come or don't come. In light of what we have been learning from Ephesians chapters 1 to 3, it says, may your life look like Jesus Christ. So Ephesians chapter, Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says, therefore if you have any encouragement being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, him in common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And then here's this really amazing phrase, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, when I had my own elder care company, I had chances to speak at UCLA and USC often on elder care issues. And I remember one particular time I was doing a seminar there with a number of other people at the USC. And the man right before me was from AARP. And he was talking about how seniors should demand their rights. And he was being so forceful and so angry. And I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. 
so I speak next. Now they knew I was a pastor, although I didn't, I wasn't in a church then. They said, we don't want you to be talking about Jesus, but you can talk about spirituality. Well, okay, so I can define that fairly broadly. <laughs> and I talked about, if you as a senior are demanding your rights, you're going to lose. And I talked at some length, just the opposite of what just the AARP guy had said. And it was interesting that I came after him and how that all went. Had a bunch of people come after me afterwards and said, you must be a Christian. Said, how do you know? <laughs> you see, the Christian does not live out of selfish ambition. And in those days, there was so much uh, emphasis on rights, gay rights, black rights, all the different things we're talking. We still hear that quite a bit. But they were talking about gray rights, and that's the old people fighting for their place in the culture. Scripture says, have nothing to do with selfish ambition or vain conceit. Philippians 4, 5 puts it this way, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. All right, so if we have our scale then, and God says, I want you to measure your life and how it's going, what do I put on one side? I put the mindset of Christ. What do I put on the other side? Me. So how does it go? Is it balanced? When people look at us and they say, man, I sure see the mindset of Christ in those folks. On the white side of the scale is the person, the attitude, and the life of Christ. On the other side is us. Simply put, it's to walk worthy of your calling is to be like Jesus, think like Jesus, love like Jesus, talk like Jesus, listen like Jesus, be like Jesus Christ. That's the simple statement of it. So what does walking like Jesus look like? Well, there's a really important fact here. This is not a matter of a feeling or emotions or opinion. This is a matter of doctrine. Now, I use that word on purpose because it's such a missed word today. And perhaps through my whole pastoral ministry, I've heard people say, doctrine divides. And does it? Yes, it does. It divides those who know the truth and those who don't. I had a conversation with a man this week, and we were talking a lot about things, and I was really asking the Lord to help me make the point I was making, and, and I thought, man, John, that was really good. This man was talking about how important team is, and there's so much written these days to the church about the church is doing team, and I said, well, that may be true, but truth triumphs team. So I thought, ooh, there's a good book title, <laughs> and I'm about ready to write it because I think it needs to be written. You know where the greatest example of that is? The 12 spies going into the promised land. Do you remember the story? God said, the promised land is yours. I promised it to you, it's yours. I just want you to go in and look at it and bring a report back. And so what happens? 10 of the 12 come back and they say, we can't do it. They're great, we're little. And there's two guys, Caleb and Joshua, who say, yes, we can, and you're wrong. Now, if you approach church by team, who are you going to follow? The ten, and you're going to criticize Joshua and Caleb. By God's design, what happened? God criticized the ten. Matter of fact, they all died in the wilderness. And the two were the ones that God preserved, and they finally went into the promised land. That's the thing that's so critical here. Team can be very dangerous if the team is not going where God wants them to go. One of the things that becomes real critical then is somebody on the team needs to be calling the team to what? Truth. Now, please know if you're a Joshua or a Caleb, you know what the team's going to do? They're going to have a celebration and say, oh, these are so great. We love these two guys. <laughs> no, what did they do? They tried to kill them. Now, I have found historically in my life in ministry that most of the time the statistics are about like that. It's 10 to 2. The people who want to really walk with God are always in the minority. 
So the question is, if we're going to walk worthy with the Lord, are we going to say, we want to be team players, but it's always based on God's truth. It is a matter of doctrine or teaching. Or I love this word, the authority and sufficiency of God's word. Now that's not popular in our day. And one of the things that we need to be charged with as the senior adults, we should know that better than any other group. And we should be calling the team consistently to God's truth. Now, one of the greatest illustrations of this, and I remember it to this day, this lady came up to me, not here, years ago. She said, my husband is the finest Christian I know, and he doesn't even believe in Jesus. Now, you'll find that language all over our culture because the definition of a Christian has something to do with things you do and you don't do. No, being a Christian has to do with does Jesus Christ live in your life and is he the Lord of that life? So we don't have to guess what walking worthy of our calling looks like. The text tells us. And one of the things I want to call us to this morning is to say, are we biblically driven people? Do we really know what Scripture has to say about a matter, whatever the matter is, and then do we declare it lovingly, kindly, all the rest of it, even when the whole team is going a different direction? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Is that then our definition of walking worthy of the Lord. Now my guess is that for many of us, we probably say, well, yeah, that sounds pretty good, but I want to put some other things just above that. And so over the next few weeks, I want us to really understand what these words mean. And we'll just set the tenor for it today. Are we people who live under the authority of God's word? Now there's a huge danger in contemporary Christianity and it's, I am the definer, or others are the definer. So I'm the one who comes and says, this is what we should do, or perhaps it's the ten saying, this is what we should do. For the Christian, we're saying, and this is what I love about our denomination, is where is it written? Now you can ask that very kindly, but it needs to be in our language all the time. So let me use Winifred as an example. Winifred always wears these really fun hats. So Winifred comes and she says, every godly woman will wear hats. And you will say? Where is She'll say, first Winifred, chapter 3, verse 2. <laughs> now that's a silly illustration. But when we come to matters of real seriousness, what is it to be a Christian? What does God want us to do? Are we people who are asking, where is it written? Now, you can ask that a couple of different ways. Paul can come to me and say, every Christian man should read the Bible. And I say, where is that? <laughs> and, and that kind of spirit can be about us some. I can come and say, you know, Paul, I'm not sure I understand this. I've been a Presbyterian my whole life, and we never study the Bible, so... <laughs> now, I was a Presbyterian, so I can say that. Uh, there's some really great Presbyterian groups. Presbyterian USA, not so. Uh, that's the group I grew up in, and so I can say that. But Paul, I, so I come and say, you know, Paul, that's really strange to me. I've never heard that before. Where is that written? And Paul would be able to tell me pretty quickly. So the manner in which we ask it is critical. <coughs> But our determination to ask it is what is important. Is it the scripture that's really defining us? We must, now please hear this. I want you to capture this today. We as older adults must ask every Christian leader. You hearing this? Every Christian leader. Every Christian writer. Every Christian worship leader. Every Christian Magician, a musician. <laughs> are you just a Christian cheerleader, or are you bringing me to God's word, 
calling and equipping me to walk worthy of it. Now, I want to go back to this and say this again. Many of us feel the burden of this. And I want to say this very carefully because whenever you make a general statement, there's always exceptions. But historically, not just now, long before us, the older ones were always entrusted with ensuring that God's gospel was clearly maintained. And you look at the history of anything, YMCA, Harvard University, Stanford University, you go almost any place, you look back, and you'll find that most of these places were found as places that were created to honor God, many of those places to raise up Christian preachers. And because people have not asked the leaders of that group, where is it written, where are they today? Now I want you to hear, look at this list with me again. I'm saying every Christian leader, every Christian leader, Graham, Byron McDonald, me, I'm certainly not putting myself in any high spot, but whoever the leader is, you're insisting, is that Christian leader being driven by the word? But it goes further than that. Every Christian writer. Do you know for sure that the writer that you're reading is a person who's really committed to scripture? I am just amazed at people who come and say, oh, this is the greatest book, uh, The Shack, is a good example many years ago. You remember that? People loved it. Awful, awful book. Uh, since I'm on a run here, um, Joel Olstein has written a book some time ago called Your Best Life Now. And I've talked about this before. The only way you can say this is my best life now is if you're a non-Christian because you know what's coming next. Hell. For the Christian, my best life will never be now, never on this earth. It's going to be an eternity. But it's much more serious than that. He's just come out with a new book now, and it has the phrase, I am in it. And if you know anything about scripture, Bible talks an awful lot about Jesus, says, I am the way of life, I am the water, I am the lamb, I am the shepherd. I mean, there's a whole bunch of the I am's great study of scripture. But you know what Olsteen's talking about? You. He says, I am. You need to know who you are. No real reference about who Christ is. Joel Olstein is a frightening heretic. Now, when you say that in circles, people will say, John, how could you be so unloving? A loving pastor will call out false teachers. And if you have any question about it, look and see what Paul had to say about false teachers. Now, please understand Every one of us who are in leadership has the capability of being a false teacher. I do. And that's where we need to hold one another accountable to say, where is it written? But that goes for every Christian writer, every Christian worship leader, every Christian musician. Are they just a cheerleader that's somehow encouraging Christian people to have a jolly good time? Or are they bringing me to God's word and calling and equipping me to walk worthy of it? Do you understand how important this is? Now, I'll warn you, friends, if you do this, you will be called all kinds of things, just like Joshua and Caleb were in the book of Numbers. But please understand, it's what God thinks of you that is the important piece. Because if you follow the ten, where are you going to go? Into disobedience and judgment. If you're Joshua and Caleb, what's going to happen? God's going to give you the promised land. And so at 80 years old, Caleb comes and God gives him the promised land. An amazing man, one of my great heroes of scripture. So I really stopped here. Do you catch this? This is so important. It centers on the sufficiency of Scripture. Do you really believe the Bible is enough? And I can't begin to tell you how many people would say, well, yes, I believe the sufficiency of Scripture, but please then read this psychology book that never talks about Jesus at all. Or um, what else could I say? Uh, go to this seminar and, and hear these people. But it's not about the Lord. It's about feeling good about yourself. Be careful. 
what you're listening to, what you're exposing yourself to, do we really believe the Bible is enough? And once I do, then I can go lots of other places, but I start with the Word. Now, this is my favorite passage to bring this up. There's a New Testament balance to it, but Psalm 19, 7 to 11. Just hear this a minute. Many of you know this well. The law of the Lord is imperfect. Yeah, perfect. I beg your pardon? Perfect. Really? Really? Yes. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's dullness to the soul. Now, I didn't share any more with you than just that. Wouldn't that be enough? Do you realize what an incredible phrase that is? It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It refreshes the soul. But notice how it goes on here. It says, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. And I love this next. Making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them is your servant warned, and keeping of them is their great reward. Now I ask you, is the word of God sufficient? Can you say those things about anything else in life? Can you say that about a church? No. Can you say that about music? No. Can you say it about a pastor or a leader? No. The only thing that fills all of those qualifications is the word of God. So the question is, are you finding those true for yourself? <coughs> are you finding to be sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb? Well, here's the New Testament parallel to it. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So is God's word sufficient for the Bible claims to be? Do we really believe that? So how do we know what it is to walk worthy of, of our calling? Well, we call together a group of people and we say we're going to take a poll and we want you all to tell us what walking worthy of our calling is, right? Isn't it amazing to you how much polls drive everything these days? You know what they are? They're calculated ignorance. And so you get enough people that say something is true, everybody believes it's true. It's not so for the Christian. We look to the authority of God's word. And we're measuring everything against it, including our own ideas. You know what happens when we don't go there? We get the externals, our religion. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance. All the things that can be done in the flesh we become very good Pharisees. Psalm 119, which is the longer list, says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might have a jolly good time. Yep. Not, sin not sin against the Lord. So the scripture becomes then our definer of everything. And we look at everything we do and we measure it against scripture. So I hear something on the television station, I hear a song, I hear a speaker, uh, I hear an opinion from a friend, I look to see in God's word, is this what it says? Where we don't know the word of God, we have no defense, we will never walk worthy of our calling. Not ever. I love the way Proverbs is. Uh, it was interesting, we were in a the staff in a thing the other day, and the man who was leading us would give you two options and you'd go to different sides of the room depending on where you, where you wanted to go. And one of the questions was, do you love Proverbs or Psalms? I just picture in your own mind, okay, here's Psalms, there's Proverbs, where would you go? In the middle, Nancy. That's kind of for me. I hated these things because I was busy in the middle. But if I'm forced to understand, I go to Proverbs. You know why? Because that's where my dad built my Christian life as a boy. We read Proverbs every day. 
And I love the psalm because that really helps you to know how to live it out. But book of Proverbs really is telling you what God wants us to know. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my uh, teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Now many of you know when you go to Israel, especially if you go to the Wailing Wall, you will see people with little boxes tied to their forehead or boxes tied around their wrist. You know what those are? It's called phylacteries, kind of an interesting phrase. But what it is is external religion. They have in those little boxes verses of scripture, thinking that somehow by doing that, they're keeping the truth of God's word. It isn't about externals. It's about having the word hidden here. Bind them on your part of your fingers, write them on the tablets of your heart. What does that mean? The good word of God is affecting everything you day. I do. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and to insight, you are my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice, and I saw among the simple, and I noticed a young man, a youth who had no sense. It starts by knowing God's truth as defined by his word. Then we can walk according to it. His word on the weight side of the scale and my life is on the other side. Now if you put anything else on the other side, then you'll find out you can do pretty well, thank you. If I put Paul on the weight side, I put myself over here, I do pretty good. If I put Olstein on one side, me on the other, I do pretty good. But when you start putting God's word on the weight side, we fall short. And that's what brings us to what we're going to see in a couple of weeks as complete humility. It starts with knowing God's truth as defined by his word and then walking accordingly. His word is on the weight side of the scale and my life is on the other side. Now this is all over scripture. Let me just back it up a little bit today. In the Old Testament, we hear God saying, if you obey me, it will be a burden to you. That's amazing. If you find all the way through the Old Testament, it says this. If you obey me, I will bless you. You know what we call that? Law. But listen about the New Testament. There's a difference here. In the New Testament, we hear God saying, I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now obey me. That's grace. Do you understand the difference? The Old Testament says you've got to obey and I'll bless Scripture says in the New Testament, because I've blessed you, obey. Law, grace. One more thing before we look at the definition of walking worthy. We need to understand our calling. For so many people, and I've talked about this a lot, I heard the gospel and decided to accept Christ as my personal Savior. I came to Jesus on my own terms. Now, I have a little bit of a problem with the song. Let me kind of illustrate this because it will shock you a bit. We sing the song uh, all the time, Graham Crusade and all the rest of it. Um, just as I am, I come. Well, that's not bad in a sense, but do you realize what you come as just as you are? We're sinners. Worthy of God's judgment. If I come on my own terms and that's all I do, I'm lost, forever lost. John 1, 10 to 13 says he, speaking of Jesus Christ, was in the world, and though the world was made by him, through him, the world did not recognize, he came to that which was his own, speaking particularly of the Jewish people, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now notice, children born, not of natural descent, or of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Now, a question. Just, I'm really curious. Is there anybody in this room who decided to be born physically? <laughs> Went to your mother and father and said, look, I want to be born physically. How about it? Now, the closest it ever got was from my parents. Ruthie and I had been married a few years, and we were at mom and dad's house. And we went and lay down in the bed where we were staying, and there was this crinkling noise. I thought, what in the world is that? 
We lift up the pipple, pip, uh, pillow, and there were pictures of babies under there. <laughs> they wanted grandchildren. <laughs> Julie is a result of pictures under the pillow. You know, we did not choose to be born. So much could be made out of that, but for today, Scripture says you didn't choose to be born spiritually either. God is the one who acted to give you spiritual birth. And when you capture that, it changes everything. When we come to fully realize that God, the sovereign, almighty God who created and rules the universe, wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I wasn't even at the foundation of the world, let alone able to say, God, you need to write my name there. He chose us and he called us to be his children, and, and that statement is what we're to live worthy of, a calling that receives and responds to what God has done in our lives. So John 15, 6 puts it this way. You did not choose me, Jesus is talking, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Do you realize that your standing before God does not depend on what you did, but on what God has done? Now, most of us know that has to do with Jesus dying on the cross in my place, but I want you to understand it goes deeper than that. God has chosen to give spiritual birth to you. And when we comprehend that, it really changes this idea of living worthy of our calling. And so 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31 says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many influential, not many of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one can boast before him. Now we're going to be talking weeks to come what humility looks like, but there's the foundation of it right there. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When you capture this, and we'll come back over the next week, and we're going to tear this apart, but you'll understand what humility is really about when you get there. 2 Corinthians 1, 11, 12 puts it this way. We constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, that by his power, he may bring to fruition in your every desire for goodness and every good, every deed prompted by the Spirit. We pray this so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him, according to the grace that is in Jesus Christ and our God. This is uh, one thing that's really important when it comes to this matter of walking according to our calling. It's not how rich or poor or successful you are in the world's eyes, not the level of our, of our education or our renown. It only matters that we walk worthy of our calling. So the one thing you're going to find when we see this in deep detail, when you are completely humble, you live the freest life you can because you're not in bondage to anything or anybody or any status or anything, you are totally free to say, God called me, I'm walking where he put me. No place for envy, no place for anything else. Colossians 3, 1 to 4 puts it this way. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So how's that translating in your life? What's it look like? If we are to walk worthy, then these things will have no place in our life. Colossians 3, 5 to 11. Put to death, therefore, 
whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed. And he goes on. He says, all of these things are idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. The life you once lived was lived like that. Now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. In other words, if you're walking worthy, you'll see as we go on in Ephesians 4, there is no place for even the hint of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Do not lie to each other. And since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image of the creator, here there's no gentle or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, bar bar barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. To walk worthy involves putting off that which is idolatry, anything that stands in God's place. But until we see the other side, we'll never live in the fullness of God. And that's the put on side. Colossians 3, 12 to 15, or 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and really love, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility. We're going to see that word over and over again starting next week gentleness, and patience. That one I wish wasn't in the list. That last one, right? patience. We'll work through that together when we get there. Just be patient. Bear with another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone, just attack them. No, if you have a grievance against anyone, what? Forgive them. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect humility. Does that sound difficult to you? It ought to. It demands the absolute power of God to live worthy of him. Just, this is just a little tiny list. We could go to more. He says, put off your earthly nature. Put on your new nature. When we get a little later in Ephesians, we're going to spend lots of time looking at that. Absolutely intriguing. But put off malice, and in its place goes kindness. Put off anger and rage, and in its place bear with one another. Put off slandering and lying and filthy language, and put on instead love and forgiveness. Now one of the things that's really dangerous, many of us think the things that we shouldn't do, and so we try to stop doing those, that's never going to cut it. God wants to replace the things we should put off with the things that we should put on. So it goes on in Colossians 3, and it says, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. No matter what the stock market's doing, no matter what the government's doing, no matter what elections are going to do, since as members of one body you were called to what? Peace. And be thankful. And here we are, the secret. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit sung to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right, so we're just beginning to see this now. Walk worthy means that I look at my life in the scale, and I say on the one side of the scale is God's word, all that he tells us about who he is and what he wants. And in this side is me. And it's all the time. How are my measuring up in any situation, any decision, any moment of any one day? Am I walking worthy of the calling? Now, do you believe that God has given you everything you need for life and godliness? He says he did. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4. Do you long to live a life worthy of your calling? Do you want to be like this? Well, if you do, you know you're a Christian. If you don't, there's no evidence at all that you are. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We are recipients of the unsearchable riches of Christ. We're adopted as his child. We are the dwelling place of God by his Spirit. We've given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our inheritance. We have access to the Father through the Spirit. We are strengthened through his Spirit in our inner being, rooted and established in his love, Filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Therefore, live like that. Now, you've got that. Take it home and look at it. Just those two slides. 
Just look at that list. What does it look like to live worthy of those things? Kyle, we're ready for our song. Philip Wed is a guy I really like as a singer, and he captures this whole idea really well in this song. life-changing because we never come to it on our own. So 
to walk a life worthy of our calling, to be completely humble, gentle, patient, forbearing, giving every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We have much to learn here. But Lord, it really comes as we submit ourselves to the doctrine of your word. And I'm so grateful we don't have to guess. I don't have to read some man-made book where his opinions will conflict with the next man who writes a book. I can come to your word, and you have clearly stated there what we're supposed to do and be and the resources we need to do. I pray, Lord, we'd be people who would be captured by your word and its sufficiency. And I pray that you'd begin to help us to understand what it looks like then. And as we, starting next week, start to look at this matter, what is it to be completely humble, that we'd be absolutely captured by it. And that we'd be characterized by it. But Lord, we want to stand, arise in your presence, to be done with lesser loyalties. And I love the phrase in that song that your, says your blood is running through our veins. That's what it is to be the children of God. You live in us and through us. So I pray over these next week as we focus more and more on this that you'll help us to have the desire, first of all, to walk worthy of you and that we would give diligence to understand it and that we would spur not only ourselves in this class on about it, but we would be the spurs for the rest of the church. I pray that when we find a church leader, a musician, a preacher, a teacher, a writer, a whoever, and they're somehow falling short of these things, that you give us the wisdom to know how to speak to them, how to write a letter to somebody like a Joe Wilson, somebody around us, that we would be the people who are calling the church to be committed to and measure everything by your word. And I'm thankful that it's not just a book, it is the very power of God. And so if you for Psalm 19, all those things that are listed there, those traits about what your word is like and their results are available to us right now. Pray that you would refresh us with your word. You'd give light to our eyes to your word. That in every sense of the word, we would be what you call us to be. Thank you then for this great challenge and the clear teaching that we're going to see in the weeks to come about what it looks like. Pray that we'd be excited about standing and following Christ wherever he leads us. He is the Son of God. We thank you that he is our, our brother and our father.